Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this session on spatial cognition and navigation. As we know, space consists of various things and we will define space and then we will see how we navigate through that space and what it means. So, just to recapitulate what we have already done, most of the discussion of spatial displays focused on two dimensions. So, displays were considered as two dimensional representations and in general displays are located on some system and therefore they are located in specific places. So, except for some eye movement, head movement, etc., real mobility is not required. But when things are distributed in space, then some movement may be required and therefore spatial cognition becomes important. The discussion on spatial displays made little reference to locomotion and other ways to move in space. And locomotion may be either because we walk, we bicycle, we move by a car or a vehicle and some other ways may be there. Then perception, attention, working memory and long term memory play significant roles in reading spatial displays. So, the information processing model plays a very important role in reading displays, arriving at some meaning based on the symbols that are used in the display and then taking an appropriate action based on that either to maintain the system running at a particular state or state in a particular status or uh, making certain changes, desirable changes are required uh, depending on the situation. So, after today's session, you should be able to describe how we perceive and move in space. So, space perception, uh, there may be different ways in which space can come to us, represent itself to us and therefore, uh, that will make a difference. Compare spatial cognition of and how humans navigate in 2D and 3D worlds. So, this distinction between two dimensional and three dimensional world becomes important because most of the representations for example, map and as displays we talked about, they are two dimensional representations in a two dimensional space. But in reality, we live in a world which is three dimensional and therefore, is the perception the same in both spaces or is there a difference? Discuss the frame of reference related issues. So, this distinction between two dimensional and three dimensional space requires introduction of something called the frame of reference. So, what is our frame of reference? Is it two dimensional or three dimensional? And then what are these directions or dimensions in that particular space? That involves an understanding of how these dimensions produce differences in the objects that we see or we perceive. Apply the principles of spatial cognition to the development of real and virtual environments. So, real environments are as we physically interact, we can touch objects, we can feel them, we can hit them and all that. But virtual environments are mostly in terms of the movement in some mental space for example. So, we either create a virtual environment on a screen for example, on a computer screen or we have some mental representation uh, which is some kind of a virtual environment or virtual space. Now, in general, space has uh, unlimited extent as we know about it. For example, we know of the outer space where it is suggested that the outer space is unlimited and there are lots of objects in the form of planets and in the form of their moons of certain planets and satellites, they are distributed all over. Now, uh, there are different types of spaces. For example, outer space as I have talked about, geographical space, social space, personal space, mental space and virtual space. The geographical space is what we live in, the geography of the place for example, terrain and hill areas, mountains and all that. Social space is in the social environment where 
individuals or humans interact with each other. That creates a social space and communication, for example, will become important and there's a different kind of activity. So one can even say that uh, communication is a process of mentally navigating one idea, one idea navigates from an individual who originates the communication and to a recipient who receives that idea or the message. Then there can be personal space. Each individual has a personal space defined by various characteristics. Uh, for example, status in the society. For example, official status somebody holds in a government office, for example. Then mental space. And mentally also we represent objects and events. And what is the nature of that space? Is the mental space similar to, in terms of the frame of reference, as the external space? For example, if we represent the external space in terms of three-dimensional Euclidean space, is the mental space also Euclidean? Or is it different by which we mean how do the various dimensions combine in the space? And in the Euclidean model, we know, for example, Pythagorean principle or theorem holds where the distance, diagonal distance between two objects is equal to square of that is equal to the sum of the squares of the individual normal uh, distances. And that is how the crow flight distance or the Euclidean distance can be computed. Does it happen also in the mental space? We will not go into that question, but that is possible, you know, that mental space reflects or it represents the external space so that it is compatible. The, you know, we have already talked about the compatibility principles. So if the mental space is compatible with the physical space, then the operations, performance, mobility, etc., navigation, etc., will be easier, will be facilitated. And then virtual space, we'll talk about the virtual space as created by certain systems, for example, on a computer screen, for example, we can create a virtual space. The focus of this session is on geographical space and its virtual and mental representations. So that is the focus. We will not be talking about social, personal uh, and outer space. We will be referring to only this space, which is, which we can say geographical state. So what is the basic concept of geographical space? Space comprises objects, events, landmarks and relationships between them. Landmarks are some significant objects, for example, monuments of historical interest or political interest, for example. And each country has certain monuments. Each city in each country has certain monuments uh, by which it is identified, for example, in uh, various places. So geographical space, uh, on the one hand, we have objects, events, and landmarks. And then we have their relationships. So relationships can be thought in terms of roots, because in a geographical space, the relationship is not in terms of how one landmark will influence another landmark. That relationship is not there. Or if we can say that uh, there, is a, there are certain characteristics which are shared, they may be shared. But the relationship here is that the two are related speci specially. That is, in space, they are related in terms of how we can move from one landmark to another, from one object to another. Or uh, if events are taking place in different places, how we can move from one place to another place. So this entire gamut can be considered as a landscape. Uh, I mean, this is just, we are making that definition here. So a landscape is nothing but comprising objects, events, and uh, landmarks, and then their relationships. So on a map, for example, the landmarks and the routes that are relating those landmarks with one another uh, on which we generally travel, uh, that entire thing constitutes a landscape. So geographical space can be considered in terms of some landscape. And if we are talking about navigation, then we are navigating in that landscape. So spatial cognition refers to space perception. This derives from the general definition of cognition. As we looked uh, during the early parts of the uh, course, where cognition was defined according to Nisar as the acquisition, transformation, representation, memorization, perception, and assigning meaning of the information from the outside world or knowledge. So spatial cognition refers to space perception, which comprises acquiring knowledge about the space, recognizing and identifying landscapes, 
developing their mental representations and transforming those representations in some way. And generally, the transformations in the physical or the geographical space is in terms of moving objects from one place to another, rotating objects in space, and there can be different ways in which objects or uh, things can be uh, rotated, and uh, then how the relationship or the roots change because of that, or will they change. So, space perception may be direct in the physical space or indirect through a scene or a map. So, one can see the objects distributed in the space or one can take a photograph or one can make a map or create a scene on a screen and uh, one can look at that and that is also uh, some uh, space perception. So, either a representation of that space of the physical, real physical space or uh, some map in the mind for example, maybe or actually printed a printed map or an electronic map. Perception, attention, working memory and long term memory contribute to navigation. So, navigation uh, requires uh, all these processes in the space. So, what is navigation? Navigation involves movement, simple, which may be direct, that is locomotion, indirect, moving in a vehicle, in geographical space or flying, or a mental walk using a map or a mental representation of the landscape. So, these are the possible movements and by navigation we mean that as compared to moving the object now as if we are moving. And when we are moving it is possible that we see the images uh, overlapping with each other and various things happening and uh, that can distort our perception of the physical space and that can affect navigation, but uh, that is a question that will come slightly later. So, what are the information processing activities involved in spatial cognition and navigation? A four critical processes can be considered. Perceive and attend to a map. So, if there is a map of a landscape, then we perceive it. Perception means we observe what are the important landmarks and how they are related. So, uh, one asks these questions, where am I? And generally on a map, they, uh, this statement or some mark on the map indicates where the individual is. So, now depending upon, uh, you know the same map can be located in a different premises of a campus, university campus or a building or a city in various places. And you are here, this particular position will change according to the location of the map. So, that that can be the starting point to move in a certain direction and then reach uh, the destination. Understand the space, which direction is east for example. By understanding we assign a meaning to the direction, it is not just where I am located and uh, then I have something in memory where I have to go, what is my destination, but uh, which is the directions now come into picture. And this involves spatial working memory, working memory has two basic components, one is spatial, other is verbal and both are important, both they work together. The complete processing of some information is based on a verbal representation and a spatial representation and then these two interact and uh, the representations can be meaningful uh, for various individuals. So, here when we are talking about space, we are referring to spatial uh, working memory. Choose a direction of movement. Will I reach the highway if I move northward? This question can be answered and this requires spatial awareness. So, it is just not sufficient to know where one is located and where one wants to go, but also the awareness of the entire layout that is important because then only one can navigate in a more efficient manner and without losing track or without losing the route or path and then reaching the destination uh, say within a given time. So, effectiveness will also be there. Execute the choice of movement and once this is decided uh, which direction is east, uh, then uh, because in uh, if I move east then probably I will reach the highway and then I take that action, action on that and move in that particular direction. So, navigation starts. So, these four processes become important spatial cognition and navigation. Now, here 
there are uh, two different views to uh, represent a frame of reference. A frame of reference is important in all domains, you know. So there has to be a frame of reference for, for communication, for example. Uh, what is the reference frame of communication, the context, the agents involved in communication. Here, the frame of reference is in terms of the physical dimensions. And there are two frames of reference. One is egocentric and the other is exocentric. Now, what is egocentric? Egocentric means it is with reference to the individual. And it is also called relative in that sense. Because then the egocentric frame of reference for different individuals located in the same physical space will be different. And so, one person located at one end of the room has uh, one frame of reference, egocentric frame of reference. If there is another person sitting at the other end of the room, then his or her uh, egocentric frame of reference will be different. And generally, it is represented in orthogonal dimensions, dimensional forms. And this is a typical way to represent a three-dimensional space, for example, uh, three-dimensional Euclidean space where x, y, and z direction represent left to right, left and right, for example. So uh, th this is so generally the x x prime axis is considered as the left to right dimension as we'll project it in the two-dimensional space, and x is considered as positive, and uh, x prime is considered as negative in a conventional manner. Uh, we could have considered it the other way around, but this is just a convention so that when we uh, want to discuss certain things, then everybody is referring to that convention and therefore uh, things are set, settled. So x and x prime, these are the left and right dimensions for example, left is x prime, right is x, right is positive, left is negative, nothing to be value based distinction, but just a conventional uh, way to represent things. Then front and back. So y and y prime are front and y is front, y prime is back. So for example, if I am like here, this is the x direction, this is the x prime direction. This is my right hand, this is my left hand. For you, you are viewing me, so your right hand and left hand will be opposite. And this is the egocentric frame of reference in that sense. And front is this front view, and this is the back view for me. For the other person sitting on the other extreme of the room, they, this thing will get reversed. And then finally, there is up and down direction, which is represented by z. So this is up direction, this is down direction. Again, up down is in terms of positive and negative. So there is a three dimensional space and any point will have coordinates on these. So the projections, if there is a point in the three dimensional space, its projection in the x, y plane is x, y, 0. It does not have any height. So this point is located just in this plane, the projection of this point. So we can project each point or each object in space and then we can have a two-dimensional representation. So if it is a six, it says it's a three-dimensional representation, there will be three different two-dimensional representations of an object and normally that is how we represent information in a map or in any other position. So the three-dimensional egocentric space indicates six directions of movement, right, left, front, back, and up and down. So these are the six directions of movement. And therefore, now we can see how the navigation is coming in in various directions of movement. Now when we have a two-dimensional projection of this three-dimensional space, then this is what a two-dimensional representation will look like. So x, x prime and y, y prime. And there are different objects located in this space, for example, uh, a, a triangle, oblique triangle and a plus sign. We can consider these as representations of some objects, some landmarks, for example. Now here, now let us look at what kind of issues will come up when we talk about navigation in a two-dimensional space. 
Now, here if we have to go from L 1 to L 2 this position from the plus a landmark plus to a landmark triangle, then uh, now these arrows indicate uh, what is the the Euclidean distance or the Clofried distance. Actually, the roots may be you know going like that, going like that, and going like that, or any other route. You know, one can go like that and go like that. Various routes may be possible. But then, if that is how we are moving, and suppose we have to tell somebody who also has a similar map in another place and similar landmarks and all that, what do we say? We say, okay. Uh, if you are at L1, then move left and since this is left, move left from here, move front and again move left. That is it. Now, let us see, suppose we had to go from L2 to L1, suppose we had to go from L2 to L1 and if uh, we are looking, you know, the maps generally will have the fixed north direction, for example, and suppose we are driving, then looking at that map, and suppose we are driving from north to south, but the map is from south to north that way. So, now looking at a map in that way is easier and will be compatible with the direction of driving. But if we are moving in that direction, then we will have to look at map in a rotated manner. And so, that will be the situation. Now, the moment we rotate the map, so that the direction of movement is compatible with the location of these landmarks and the direction routes on the map, then there is a problem, you know. The, for example, the, uh, these get reversed, inverted, and so now you can see y and y prime. Uh, they get inverted and then the direction of movement is that. Now, this inverted one is difficult to read because there will be actually some names or some other things that will be there associated with them. So, if we want to instruct people, if we are using a particular map and if we want to instruct people, then it is uh, first of all assume that everybody is using the same map and then assume that everybody, there are no individual differences. So, everybody can understand how to use this map in a specific orientation irrespective of whether we are moving northward, southward, eastward, but always keep the map in that orientation because that will be easy to read and that is how uh, we have been trained to read the map. So, there will be certain difficulties with this. So, now there is some difficulty with the 2D rotation of map. First is difficult to understand the environment if the map continuously rotates. Suppose we always want to keep the map in an orientation which is correct with respect to our direction of movement, then the environment keeps on changing. In a GPS for example, when we drive, the route keeps straight in front of us. So, as we are driving uh, in a certain direction, the route is that, but if we turn to a certain direction, the route again becomes like that. So, every time we see a straight forward moving direction. Now, by doing that, uh, we cannot really understand the environment in which we are moving. Then there are individual differences in cost of reading a north of map when moving in other direction. So, when for example, somebody is moving in uh, that direction or in that direction as we have taken this particular example, then reading the 2D map, a fixed 2D map with north up indication uh, will be difficult. In communicating directions, a world reference map north south is better shared and less ambiguous than the egocentric frame of reference. For example, left to right. In the reverse thing, uh, left to right becomes right to left. Okay, that is the change. So, electronic maps preserve a fixed north up orientation mode. So, that may be better or worse, but then still that limitation of understanding the environment will be there. Then there is the cardinal or exocentric world reference absolute or absolute frame of reference, where there will be no individual differences in terms of the orientation. 
they are fixed directions north south east west up down and these are the north south east west are the campus compass uh, directions and therefore they are fixed wherever we go the north will always be uh, the compass will always point uh, in the north south direction so we know that direction is fixed and therefore this is cardinal this is world referenced this is absolute there is nothing to depend on the individuals and the two dimensional representation of a uh, cardinal space will always be like this north will always be north east will be east and south will be south so if we say uh, if we rotate this and we say move northward then northward is the same on all maps and therefore there will be no confusion as the moment it comes to the point of making instruction this is just an example to indicate you know how in different uh, forms this can happen so here is an egocentric uh, small exercise if you walk on the sides of the figure in the in this slide figure read it as below starting from the place marked this and completing the periphery how many left turns will you take now this depends upon whether you take a left turn clockwise or take a uh, left turn uh, move in the counter clockwise direction and then there will be three left turns in the clockwise direction and seven left turns in the counter clockwise direction so the number of left turns is changing in the clockwise and counter clockwise direction now this is according to the cardinal frame of reference of representation uh, figure uh, below starting from the place mart and completing the periphery how many times will you be moving towards the east so towards the east means you are uh, you can see that if you are starting here and then again moving clockwise or counter clockwise eastward move will be two times if you move clockwise so this is eastward movement and this is eastward movement just two but eastward move will be three times if you move counter clockwise so if you move counter clockwise then 1 2 and 3 eastward moves so depending upon the direction these are now fixed and this is fixed in terms of now we can talk in terms of eastward southward or northward movement and that problem of the egocentric frame uh, is now over now left turn and right what is important to get from here is left turn and right turn are appropriate to driving in a city and we driving in a city and if we want to instruct somebody uh, because we know the exactly the route and we say okay uh, take this route at the third crossing turn left and then at the second crossing again turn left right or whatever you know that can be the instruction but for a, for the city route it will hold but if there is a car rally and distances are very large and terrains may be very different the landmarks may not be easily locatable uh, there may not be so many crossings for example landmarks may not be uh, there identifiable clearly then moving eastward or using the cardinal map is appropriate to a car racing for example so depending upon the nature of the task different representations uh, of space will be useful now what does 3d mental rotation mean 3d mental rotation can be in three different planes or normal to three different axes we can look at it that way so it is more complex than 2d mental rotation we'll see what is 2d how is it simple so transformation of frames of reference between three orthogonal 2d planes so there are three orthogonal planes uh, north south plane east west plane and up down plane three different planes and rotations can be in three different planes so we can think of this cube to be projected onto this plane a two dimensional representation and then if we rotate it along that axis then it will be that two dimensional space so this is you know this complex and these arrows indicate uh, the direction of uh, rotation uh, in the north south 
plane, east west plane, or up down plane. Now, this requires comparative judgments between images. Different images will be there. If this rotates in different planes, there is a simple cube. So, it may appear very simple, but objects need not be so symmetric, so simple, they will be very complex in nature. And therefore, rotation in different planes will lead to different images. And these are just simple projections in different planes. The object can really rotate across any axis and it can create different kinds of images. So, direction of rotation is an important consideration and there can be three basic directions of rotation, but there can be more complex uh, movement. For example, across this particular axis and if there is an axis, this axis, then the shape of the cube will appear to change. It may be able to be cuboid, uh, where the edges do not have the equal size and all that. So, this gives a simple view of a two dimensional and three dimensional. Now, assume that this is a three dimensional object, then in the normal plane, normal plane means the direction from which we are looking at the object, in the, if it rotates in the normal plane, then we see that the shape of the object is not changing shape remains the same and therefore, the object is identifiable. But if we rotate it in the three dimensional space in the uh, you know in uh, that space for example, in that plane along that axis, then from the top if it rotates by 90 degrees, then we will see this view and that view will be just like this. Imagine the shape has completely changed and if the rotation were not 90 degrees, if they were somewhere in between, then uh, it will be a very uh, you know different kind of change in the shape. And now imagine if it were rotating across that axis or across any other axis, what would happen? Now, what does this rotation mean? As we know the objects the in the landscape, nothing will rotate, but when we move, for example, if we are flying and we are looking at a landscape from a distance, when we move the in the three dimension, because we are looking at a three dimensional space, not on the map now, we are looking at in three dimensional space. So, the object will appear to be moving and they will be appearing to be rotating. And when they appear to be rotating, then they are uh, you know if we get to see only the top view, we will see this. If we get to see, for example, when a plane gets tilted, you know, and then uh, we'll see this view, so the views can change. So, what is the best way to handle this problem? Should there is there a possible direction of movement that will provide us information about the top view as well as the front view, and therefore, you know, we can make out. So, generally, they suggest that if you are viewing at an angle of about 45 degrees, then some view of the, some frontal view will be available and some top view will be available. And if that is the case, then identifiability, recognition of the landmark or other things will be simple. So, there is some cost benefit matrix of task and display frame of reference. If we use a certain frame of reference, should this be related to or chosen? depending upon the task that we have to perform. And you know this has been found that uh, there can be 2D coplanar representation, 3D exocentric representation, 3D immersed representation. 3D exocentric means I am having an outside in view of a landmark and 3D immersed means I am inside, I am within the environment, I am immersed in the environment. And then there can be verbal loot lists which one is good for which kind of task. So, if there is a navigational travel, navigation travel I am moving, then landmark comparison has a negative, uh, is negatively suitable. It is not really that suitable for 2D because your landmark is not visible. Landmark is something which is significant, a building for example. So, the height of the building and other things can become important, but if it is a 2D representation, that particular feature of the building would be missing. And therefore, the 
landmark comparison will not be good for navigational travel, 2D uh, coplanar representation. But in a 3D immersed view, if I am inside, then I can look at tall building. For example, in India, they can see the statue of uh, Sadar Patel in Gujarat, or they can uh, see the Kutub Minar. Or the, so these are tall buildings, which can be seen from a distance. And if it is a very narrow vision because of the building, high rise buildings, then the nearby landmarks can be easily seen. They are, they are visible. So this has a positive impact, 3D immersed view or display frame of reference is very positively suitable for navigational. And verbal route has uh, you know, no meaning. You know, verbal route really uh, provides no understanding. Uh, it, it has also negative suitability for navigation. It does not provide any understanding. It does not provide precise judgment. By understanding, we mean understanding what is the relationship between the landmarks, objects in the physical space or in the geographical space, by understanding we mean that and we can negotiate appropriately uh, with that landmark. So now we can see that, uh, you know, this is how this table provides different ways to understand the, 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 the field of view, for example, because 2D presents a wide field of view. When the moment I see a 2D representation, then a wide field of view is available to me, a map for example, and that is positively suitable. But landmark comparison has, is negative even for understanding. Then in 3D exocentric, there is a broad view, again broad field of view, again this has positive suitability and landmark comparison remains uh, the positive. So these positive and negative marks indicate suitability or uh, less suitability, so more suitability. So a, a 3D exocentric representation is positively suitable for understanding because it presents a broad field of view and it presents a high landmark comparison. So this is the best choice, 3D exocentric is the best choice for understanding. And similarly, other things can be discussed uh, and uh, uh, loss LOS is line of sight. You know line of sight uh, is ambiguous in a 3D representation because objects can be hidden the moment I move then in 3D representation as I move uh, the objects will appear to be uh, appearing and disappearing uh, behind some other object and so on. But in a uh, the linear distance is very good here and there is a there is an ambiguity in uh, case of 3D representations. So depending upon that uh, kind of matrix, it, it indicates that if we are into precise judgment, then this is the best choice. So how to handle the frame problem? Design multiple maps. So we can have multiple maps, 2D, 3D, different orientations. Training on navigational knowledge, so training can be helpful. There is three types of knowledge, landmark knowledge, route knowledge and survey knowledge. Now landmark knowledge uh, will be, can be made available from a list for example. It is not uh, much of uh, demanding, so one can uh, have a list of various landmarks in a city and then um, that can be seen. How are the landmarks related? For that route knowledge is important. And therefore, actually navigating through the city, through those routes, and then seeing the distances and how relatively the uh, landmarks are located, that experience will lead to route knowledge. And then survey knowledge from the map itself, for example. So can we learn about the routes from the map? We can. But the, you know, from route knowledge to survey knowledge, uh, there is a better uh, possibility, higher possibility of developing survey knowledge from root knowledge, whereas in the other way direction, there is a slightly uh, less possibility of developing a root knowledge from a survey knowledge. So map design, what should be the design of a map? 2D maps, uh, say head, heading up maps to achieve congruence between the map and the forward views. So normally we move in the forward direction and 2D maps 
design in that way can be useful. 3D maps, cost benefit matrix has direct implications. So we have already seen how you know that cost benefit matrix can help us in designing 2D or 3D maps depending upon the task that we have to perform. Then map scale is important. What should be the map scale? Map scale should be, if it is two scale, then we can immediately get an idea about the relative distances between the landmarks. Clutter and map search is something you know which has to be taken care of while designing a map. It shouldn't be too cluttered. Too cluttered means uh, there are different causes. You know, we enter too much data, too many names, uh, too many things into the map, and it becomes cluttered. And it's a small map. And when we want to view it on a small screen, it becomes appears to be more cluttered and uh, doesn't appear very meaningful. Database overlays. So if there are database overlays, that means we have the map, we have an you know, overlay created based on the data and we overlay it. Then we want to show, for example, the temperature variation in a city along with how the landscape is there. Then that can uh, be problematic. Then there are some clutter solutions. Uh, the clutter solutions possible are give as minimal information as possible and uh, minute printing and various other solutions of this kind can be found. Then information visualization. Information visualization refers to information presentation in a meaningful and easily understandable way. For example, scientists may generate uh, pictorial representations of uh, atomic structures. And this atomic structure is a visualization. Uh, it may, this is a model, right? And this is a visualization. So visualization may re require creativity, synthesization, and then creating something uh, on the basis of which things can be understood. It's a kind of a model in that sense. Data structure, data mapping, and proximity compatibility. These principles are some examples of information visualization. We have talked about these. And you can um, recall uh, lecture 9, uh, where we talked about uh, various compatibility principles. And we talked about uh, these compatibility principles there, which are useful in information visualization. For example, ecological compatibility, uh, how to ecologically make the, epi the representation ecologically compatible with the actual physical data, and so on. Then what are the tasks in visualization? Search tasks. For example, finding a file in a computer. So visualization means in an environment where a lot of data is available. So you have huge data. A number of files may be located in that. So in a big computer, for example. And then if we want to search for it, then how quickly can we search for that particular file? That can be a question. Search task should be facilitated. Representation should be, the visualization should be done in that way. Task involving information integration, say comparative visualization, data comparison, biology, finance, transportation, or medicine, they are important across uh, various situations, conditions. Data are compared, and uh, one can find out which kind of uh, variables have a positive impact on uh, certain developments. And choosing a particular algorithm for data analytics. This, here, you know, one has to compare. So if there are two software, then are they equally efficient or uh, are they equally effective in finding a solution? How much time will a software take to solve the problem? Is it faster than the other software? So this choice will require information integration from various sources. Then insights, discovering relationships as in scientific visualization. So developing models, large scale models from graphs, trying to understand what are those relationships. And so creativity. Insights would mean uh, getting into some process of creativity, creating new ideas and new models, for example. These are some principles of visualization. Compatible mapping of visual dimensions is important. Choosing visual variable for display representation that is compatible with the data type, say qualitative or quantitative. We made a distinction between qualitative and quantitative data. With qualitative data, uh, there's a limited 
possibility of applying an, even an basic arithmetic principle. We cannot add, we cannot subtract, nothing can be done because they can be just counted frequencies uh, generally. But with quantitative data, it is possible to do various kinds of analysis. So they are different. And therefore, their representation and their visualization will also require different things. And again, this lecture 9 gives that. And also compatible mapping of data structure. Since we have already talked about these in lecture 9, so again, you can recall that and you can visit, revisit that particular lecture. So these two principles, compatible mapping and compatible mapping of data structure, of mapping of visual dimensions and data structure. And then visualization of uh, and another principle is multiple views. Present the data, multiple views of the data, say two or more views to inspect a single conceptual entity. So normally what is done is uh, diverse information can be presented and basic idea is that if present a global view, this for example, uh, this part can be considered as a global view, what all is there and then present a uh, more uh, you know zoomed in view. So we present a zoomed in view and then uh, present a search what we want to search, you know. So if that is the order, that first present a larger picture, essential features basically. Then some view which may be very relevant to one part of that and zoom in on that. So one can say for example zoom in here and for that get uh, some information. And then then can be search, find. So searching, you know, uh, where a, a decision would be required, etc. So something has to be searched, some effort may be required. And effort right from the beginning is not very useful. So keeping the viewer or the user, uh, helping the viewer, engaging the viewer, it is important that multiple views are presented. And multiple views are present there right now. Multiple views have several advantages. We look at these. So these are some guidelines for using multiple views. And these are the major positive impacts on utilities. Uh, in black and in red, major negative impacts. So diversity. So diversity means we are presenting information in various ways, in diverse ways. This helps memory because memory requires some kind of organization of information. And when diverse views are presented, the information comes to us in an organized manner. Say we have this overall view and as if there is some kind of a hierarchical organization. Say we have a summary view, then we have slightly more detailed view and then we have find on demand, information on demand that is some effort. So, you know, complete organization is there from global to very specific information. And that organization is very helpful in memory. Then complementarity, memory, comparison, context switching, all this, there are complementary, uh, you know, processes. But uh, learning, display space and computational overheads, more space is required. As, and this is also a negative in diversity. So as you use diversity, complementarity, more space is required and that is a negative aspect. Decomposition, again memory and if we want to decompose information, then uh, this is again helpful, decomposition of information. Then parsimony, parsimony means using fewer resources, for example, using fewer concepts to explain certain phenomenon. So a theory that uses fewer concepts to explain a phenomenon is a parsimonious theory compared to another theory which uses more concepts. So parsimony is in terms of the scarcity, the, the, not scarcity but efficiency with which or fewer concepts with which you can explain a phenomenon uh, for which some other theory uses larger number of concepts. And learning display space and computational overheads, uh, you know, uh, they can be minimized because of this. Then phase time resource optimization, 
comparison display space and computational overheads. Uh, this is very good. Resource optimization is there and not many resources would be required. Self-evidence, learning comparison, but computational overheads will be there. Okay. So a lot of computational overheads will be required, relating things, for example, and consistency, learning comparison, computational overheads may be there, and attention and management, memory context switching, and again com computational overhead. So guide, so one, you know, these will be the positive and negative effects on utilities, but uh, depending upon the requirement, these can be done. For example, the search becomes easier. Uh, generally, if you open a uh, document in PDF form, then you will find that there is a page view or thumb nails here, and for a particular page, this information is there. So now, this helps that if we are browsing or we are looking at a larger piece of information, we may have a feeling of being lost or an experience of being lost. So how do we recover where are we, for example? Because in large data sets, where are we? Where am I right now? That is important. So for this zoom in view, uh, this may be for this thumbnail. If you know exactly uh, where we are, and therefore we can come back, we come back and move forward based on that. Now, what do multiple views pre do? They prevent the keyhole phenomenon. For example, when scrolling a list. Keyhole phenomenon is that we have a very limited field of view. For example, when we are in an immersed view, uh, we talked about the keyhole phenomenon here. When we are in an immersed 3D representation, then we can see only some part of the, it's like keyhole camera, you know, uh, small uh, from window or from the keyhole we are peeping outside and we can see only a part of the entire environment and therefore understanding of the environment will be very poor. So this is how the, uh, you know, if we have multiple views, uh, if we use multiple views, then this keyhole phenomenon problem issue can be handled. Then the feeling or experience of being lost through the fisheye view. So we can use the fisheye view. You know, fisheye uh, view is very wide compared to humans. Humans have a width of about 155 degrees, whereas fish has a view of about 165 degrees. So fisheye view is wider. Although the vertical span of the fisheye is only half, about 12 degrees, as compared to humans, which is about 24 degrees. But the wide angle of the field of view in a fisheye view is very useful, again, uh, in terms of if we get lost in all that. So this is an example of a, a fisheye view. So there is something in focus in the fisheye, and whatever is at extremes, uh, that is not immediately available to the eye. And But the moment you move the eye to that position, that will become in focus. So this can be the, you know, different parts of the image can be sampled. Now what are virtual environments or virtual reality? Virtual environment is a computer generated environment that gives user the experience of being in a particular location different from where the user actually is. So I may be here, I may present a virtual environment through a computer screen or something else, and then I may have a feeling that I am there. I can create three-dimensional virtual environments, for example, and I will have a feeling that I am there in that place. So virtual environment is an approach to replace reality with a virtual world. So. Um, you know, uh, they may say that uh, when we look at a video, at a film, for example, we are living in a virtual world. And for uh, children, it may be difficult to really make a distinction between the real world and the virtual world if they really don't know what is happening. So making this distinction uh, can be important. 
and virtual world has several advantages that a large piece of information can be presented and again we can interact with the virtual world in a certain way as uh, for example this uh, figure uh, represents. So you, we can select certain part of the virtual world and then we can uh, zoom in, uh, we can expand it and we can try to understand. And if there is a hazardous, if there are certain uh, hazardous things uh, or environments that we want to avoid but we want to have a clear picture about that then uh, virtual uh, environment or virtual reality is very useful. Now the typical features of virtual environments is three dimensional viewing is possible you know that is so I can uh, rotate the virtual environment on the screen as if and it will appear as if I am looking at that environment by rotating myself so I am getting different views of the complete environment. It is, you know, dynamic, can be made dynamic. Video, for example, is a dynamic representation. And that gives a feeling of reality as if I'm there. It's not the real environment, but the experience is that. Then closed loop interaction, there should be little lag. Normally, you know, there's a slight problem with the virtual environments that in real world, if I interact with an object, I pick it up, then there's an instantaneous feedback to me. We talked about feedback in earlier lectures. Then, in, while talking about skilled performance, and but in the virtual environment, there's a lag. It takes time. Then it uses ego-centered frame of reference. From my perspective, I see the virtual environment. Head or eye motion uh, uh, can track by using head-mounted displays and computer-automated virtual environments. You know that can be done. So I can head-mount a uh, display and then I can use that to see the virtual environment and then uh, multimodal interaction is possible for example I can see a visual scene I can use a haptic modality auditory tactile uh, modality and so on at the same time so uh, there can be a seven dimensional experience for example of vision of different dimensions of hearing, of different dimensions of vision, the tactual, the olfactory. So I can be seated in a room, in a chair, uh, which can tilt. And uh, you know, I can get the feeling as if I am in the real environment. The advantage is that some kind of training can be done and also it can be used for therapeutic purposes. And then a distinction can be made between objects and agents. There are various training application virtual environments, haptic perception. Haptic means I can feel an object, I can manipulate it and I can tell what is the shape of this object without looking at it. E-learning is facilitated, then online comprehension is possible, therapeutic applications as I said, for example if an individual has anxiety, then uh, one can be presented with a situation uh, which can create anxiety without really ha possibility of harming the individual and then that experience can be used as uh, for therapeutic purposes. Then there are some social applications, gaming, multi-agent environments and collaborations and ubiquitous computing. In ubiquitous computing, for example, I can um, be operating a computer somewhere and I create an image and I put it on a table, for example, and another person sitting elsewhere can pull that image to his or her computer. So as if it is happening in the real world, it is ubiquitous uh, computing. Now this is an example of the, uh, the multi-agent situation where interaction is taking place and it is for health data exchange. So this is, you know, the uh, multi-agent environments where peer-to-peer -peer architecture is there and uh, this can be useful. Then augmented reality is another area which can be useful and uh, this uh, can be represented, uh, you know, uh, for example, virtual reality can and augmented reality, virtual reality and real environment can be combined to give an image and that will be useful and that can be scaled on a virtual ruler. Now cost, lag, biases and distortions, feeling or experience of being lost and distortion and cyber sickness, you know, movement sickness is there. 
The spatial, so summary, spatial cognition involves perception and making sense of the environment, use of appropriate display framed of reference for cognitive tasks, can optimize costs and benefits. The virtual ruler provides a useful approach toward representing augmented and virtual reality as two opposite extremes on a continuum. Now, these are some questions for discussion which you can look at and uh, there are particularly some references which can be found and they can be the starting point for answering these questions. Uh, these are the references. Thank you very much.